Good afternoon and welcome to the Caregiver Teleconnection. My name is Glenda Rogers and I'm going to be your host for today's session. Today we have with us Dr. Cam Cummings and she's going to be talking about the ABCs of vascular dementia. Let me tell you just a little bit about Tam if you have not been on a session with her before. Dr. Tam Cummings founded her company in 2009 with the mission to inspire, educate, and empower dementia caregivers. Now her professional gerontological practice in the Hill, Texas Hill Country is recognized as one of the leading educators of dementia caregivers and program design for dementia care nationally. Tam, welcome to the session. Hi, Glenda, and where are our VTOS friends? Well, let's see. I never got any information on it. Is anyone out there from, from uh, VTEC? Let's see. Hi, Les. It's Courtney. There you are. Hi, there you are. We Hello. just didn't get information on who it would be, Candace. Please go ahead and tell us a little bit about VTOS. Sure. Thank you so much for having me today. I really appreciate it. So my name is Courtney Hernandez, and I'm with VTOS Hospice. Um, and I wanted to come and talk a little bit about um, it, it, with National Healthcare Decisions Day is coming up on April the 16th. And it may be time to talk to your loved ones about the type of care that you prefer when nearing the end of life. Uh, this may seem a long way off, but ideally this discussion begins while you're still healthy and having this meaningful conversation ensures your loved ones will know your wishes whenever the time comes since none of us knows when that is, it helps to be prepared in advance. And so an advanced care planning directive can always be changed, yet having a written document or roadmap that details your choices will ensure that you have the medical care that you wish, even if you can't communicate it later to your family and your loved ones. Um, so during the last six months of your life or so, you may want to be free from treatment that doesn't make you feel better, but instead can make you feel almost worse, you know, so uh, you likely will want to be comfortable in a familiar setting and surroundings of home and loved ones with the best care available. And um, you may desire compassionate care from a team of specialists, including nurses and doctors, assistants, chaplains, and bereavement managers, and others that can support you and your family and um, focusing on quality of life during the remaining months can mean that you choose the hospice care. So uh, hospice enables you to choose your care setting, whether it's in a private residence and you're at home or assisted living facility, skilled nursing facility, or an inpatient unit, um, what sets apart hospice is the coordinated care that you'll receive, and um, it offers a comfort and dignity of your final months, and hospice can also provide respite care for family caregivers who need a break so that they can keep giving you their best care as well. Um, so whatever option that you do choose it is helpful uh, to provide clear directives to your loved ones and discussing a uh, care plan with the family means that uh, no one has to guess what your preferences are and um, you likely will want your family to be relieved of the stress so you can spend time together and uh, share memories and thoughts so um, as you consider, you know, these important life questions, VTOS is here to assist you and you can always call us for any information. But the number is 1-800-723-3233 uh, and you can always visit VTOS.com as well. You can find a plethora of information on our website. Um, and uh, so we definitely will offer support from um, VTOS, which is the nation's leading provider of end-of-life care. And we are available for information, admissions, referrals 24-7. So that's my, that's my hospice bill. And I really appreciate everyone letting me be on the call and speaking with you today. Thank you so much. And thanks to VTOS for sponsoring the call today for the session today. Hope yes, ma'am. Bye bye. Okay. You ready to go, Tam? I'm ready. All right. Let's go. All right. So, you know, she just said something.
something that was really very important. Having that conversation before the crisis hits, it, it, it helps survivors feel better. It helps us all get better. I had an aunt and uncle begin to plan their end of life care about 40 years ago. And we finally had to stop them because their playlist was now 12 hours long of what they wanted. It, they just had gone crazy with it. But it, it's so important to have those conversations. And, and it's, once you do it, it's it's done. And everybody knows what mama wants, what daddy wants, what, what and then we're all united. So it, it really is such a helpful thing. But today we're going to talk about uh, vascular dementia. And Glenda, this is, uh, <laughs> got to press the right buttons here, make my stuff work. Okay. So when we think about vascular dementia, like all the dementias, do you want the good news or the bad news? And of course, you know, I'm, I'm all positive, want to be positive. Let's look at the good news. We can be preventative of vascular conditions, uh, medications, diet, exercise, paying attention to our cardiovascular health, paying attention to our diet, to our sugar, understanding that our true blood pressure is not me handing the nurse my dominant right arm, but it's me ha having the nurse take my blood pressure, standing, sitting, lying down on both sides. That's my true blood pressure. So every now and then I need to have my true blood pressure taken. Um, it means paying attention to our cardiovascular uh, systems and just to our overall body health and care. It is really terrible things. It's diet and exercise. It's, it's doing things for ourselves that we should be naturally doing and we don't because processed foods covered in sugar and we all love sugar. That, that really is so much of it. It is following things like the Mediterranean diet. Uh, a diabetic diet, getting up and moving your body, stopping smoking. And you know, Glenda, one of the things that I think is, is just, it blows my mind about smoking is nicotine is the most addictive drug we know. It's more addictive than meth or crack or cocaine or heroin or whatever else is out there. The most addictive drug we know it's legal for you to buy it, own it, carry it, and use it, yet we have no official rehab for you as a smoker. We just tell you to quit. Right. But everybody else, we send to an actual physical place to help them quit smoking. So it's smoking, it's drinking. Um, several years ago, we were allowed two drinks a day, then it became one alcoholic drink a day, and now we're at, really, we shouldn't be drinking at all, is the current a feeling about aging your brain. Now, for those of us who are in Texas, I just heard a collective gasp because as Texans, we are leading the nation during COVID and drinking, but drinking is really not good for us uh, at, at any point in our life. And it's not, it's not good for us as, as we age. Being healthy and not developing vascular dementia means the two ugliest words in the English language, diet and exercise. It means really paying attention to what goes in our body and to us actually using our body. You know, so many people, Glenda, think use it or lose it means uh, being able to move, but it actually means being able to move and use your brain and take care of your body and brain together as one unit, not it's okay for me to not move my body as long as I read interesting stuff all day. It means an equal balance of both of those. And it's diet and exercise because our brain wants our body to move because when we move our body, it produces certain chemical reactions in the brain. And because humans evolved to move. It's only in the last few generations that this is trained. Now, we have treatments for people who have developed vascular conditions. Um, we have found out so much stuff in the last several decades. We now know, Glenda, that you can be this big around and you run marathons, but you inherited high cholesterol. Mm -hmm. So it turns out you've got your daddy's blue eyes. You might have also gotten a bad ticker just because of, of the inherited uh, component of, of that person being your biological parent. But we have procedures to improve blood flow. We have stress tests that we send people to. And I had an uncle 
Glenda was a cattle buyer and the joke in the family was uh, he's a cattle buyer he's not that smart but I thought he's a pretty smart guy he had three heart attacks and every time he had one he had it in the cardiologist office doing the stress test so that's a brilliant man right there you can have angioplasty stenting done we have medicines to help with cardio conditions we have medicines to help with heart conditions we have things like defibrillators and pacemakers and then once again, we come back down to diet and exercise. And for your loved one, if they've got dementia and they're still early enough in the disease, so socialization such as adult daycare for them is very important, both for their vascular condition, but also for your own as it provides you respite care. Now, as simple as those things sound, Glenda, it's much more complex. There are multiple causations of vascular dementias. Um, it's, it's not just diet and exercise, but then it really is kind of diet and exercise because that's just how slow human evolution is. Some people might have inherited something. We know that people in certain parts of the country, people with certain incomes get better medical care or more likely to get medical care. So something might be found out with you that's not found out with another person because they simply don't have the means or the education or the ability to get to a physician. There are things that we can control and then there's things we can't. There are some things that come with being male or female or being of a certain race that are just part of that physiology. Um, there might be a recognition of the issue or somebody might not pay attention to anything at all. And for many people, you might think about going so far as, as surgery to help with a physical condition, especially obesity is, is a serious thing with vascular conditions, or you may elect to begin to make smaller changes. I read once, Glenda, that, um, oh, one of the national broadcasters, maybe Tom Brokoff, that they asked him, since he had to eat out all the time as part of his job because he was of, of, of what he did, how did he not end up being just a really big guy? He said, well, I eat out twice a day and every time they bring me my plate of food, they bring me a separate plate and I immediately cut my food in half and put half of my food on that plate. And he said, so the hardest part is I paid for a full meal but I'm only gonna eat half of it. And I finally begin to do that in my own life. And I begin to use the plates my grandmother used, which are this big. And these are people that worked in the field all day. And I started using those plates instead of today's dinner plate, which are those huge giant plates our grandparents would have considered platters. Everything I do, I am trying to walk and move and bend and reach. And for me, this really came to fruition because a friend of mine, husband is in his 50s but every time he does anything he does it running if his wife said I want you to go to the car and bring my purse in I forgot my purse he runs to the car and he runs back and his logic is I've got to exercise my body if you are looking for programs go to YouTube tons of programs on YouTube whether it's Tai Chi yoga chair yoga chair exercises and then as much as you can walk. Walking is critical because like dancing, it moves the body. It causes the brain to look, move large muscle mass. And that's a great exercise for the brain. Now for families, when your person has vascular dementia, it may go unnoticed for a while because it doesn't look like Alzheimer's. And everybody thinks that the only dementia out there is Alzheimer's and that everybody has Alzheimer's. And even if you don't have Alzheimer's, you're gonna have short-term memory loss. And in vascular dementia, Glenda, you may not have short-term memory loss right away. You might not have, your person might not have short-term memory loss until very late in the disease, although they could have vascular dementia and have short-term memory, memory loss, but the presentation is different. In Alzheimer's, we always think about people going down the slippery slope. They just continue to go down the scale from adulthood to infancy. In vascular dementia, because the condition being caused and that's causing damage to the brain is happening 
in very tiny uh, places and it's a cumulative effect over time, whether it's one massive thing, it's a different presentation. The family suddenly realizes that something's really wrong with mom. And many times, Glenda, the family can actually point to on this date, something got different with mom. And that's usually an indicator of vascular. But then the person appears stable to the family for a long time, but then there will be a step down. And so vascular people stair step through the stages. And what we know is so difficult for the vascular dementia family is that every time their person stabilizes, they think it doesn't get any worse. Whereas the Alzheimer's family sees this daily decline of it gets worse. Does, does that make sense, Glenda? Yeah, it absolutely does. I hadn't thought of it that way, but yeah, it makes sense. And so because the person doesn't present like Alzheimer's, you also get even less support from family members, from neighbors, from professional caregivers, from paramedics than you do if the disease is Alzheimer's. And of course, any dementia person gets treated differently than if you told people they have brain cancer because people understand brain cancer, but they don't understand dementias. So the families don't get as much support and the families, people with vascular dementia, Glenda, have a higher level of physical and verbal agitation. And, and we don't quite understand that. Maybe it's that they can feel their brains not working and it's like when you and I can't find that word and it's just starting to frustrate you because you can't find that word. And maybe it's something like that. Maybe it's that they're angry that they can feel the thought and then the thought is gone before they can even get it out. But they tend to be more verbally and physically agitated. And so as regular humans, every time my loved one with vascular dementia does something wrong, I point it out to them, even though that's the absolute last thing I should be doing. I should understand this person has brain damage. Stop pointing it out to them. Their brain doesn't recognize anything's wrong. But in a person with vascular dementia, they may recognize something is wrong because they can no longer move part of their body because the stroke was so large. Or they may have changes in them that you and I don't recognize. They don't see the world around them the same way anymore. So when you and I walk, walk by too quickly, we scare them. And if they're naturally a fighter, they're going to kick or punch out at you. And you caused that behavior, not them, because you didn't recognize you were scaring them because as part of this disease, your person tends to be more physically and verbally agitated. And every time we tell them that there's something wrong with them, you only make it worse. Mm -hmm. And that presentation is not quite the same as the Alzheimer's person, where typically the first thing noticed is the, law, the lack of short-term memory and that beginning to repeat everything. And then of course, for people with vascular dementia, in many cases, that dementia didn't just appear overnight. It's been in place for a long, long time. And what we know is if you have any dementia and live long enough, Alzheimer's creeps in as well. And so there's a good chance in vascular dementia that a lot of families actually have a loved one with Alzheimer's that has joined the vascular dementia as well. Now, vascular dementia is acquired cognitive and functional impairments that are the results of the effect of something vascular. So there's four reasons dementias are named, Glenda. They're named for the doctor. They're named for the brain, frontal temporal dementias. They're named for what they're going to do, or they're named for their actual cause. And when I ask it at conferences, I'm always amazed that I say, and so a dementia that would be named for its actual cause would be, and nobody gets it, the answer is clearly vascular dementia. Vascular dementia is telling you something vascular caused it. It's just that we still have people that don't recognize Alzheimer's is between 40 and 50% of the dementias, not 90% of the dementias, but closer to 40 to 50%, which means that Vascular dementia is most often misidentified or labeled as Alzheimer's dementia when in reality the person has vascular dementia occurring. Did that make sense, Glenda? 
It does. I had experienced that with a, a personal friend of mine that I thought she might have vascular dementia, but as I took her to the neurologist, he said, no, it was Alzheimer's. It was kind of like what you were talking about. There was a plateau, and so I'm not sure, <laughs> but at any rate, I understand the difference. Okay. Now, th the bad news for grandkids and, and great-grandkids is that we believe that today's teenager will have extraordinarily high cardiovascular deaths that will occur in their 30s, their 40s, and their 50s. Mm -hmm. We believe that we will have the highest levels of diabetes we have ever seen in people in this group when they reach their 30s, their 40s, and their 50s due to the amount of sugar and processed food they take in. So today's Six-month-old children, Glenda, recognize the golden arches. Yep. And it's not unusual that children leave a school where they ate processed food and on the way home, they have more processed food and then they get home and they may have more processed food and then have processed food before dinner and human beings never ate that way. I think people are probably shocked when they realize that a kid's meal at any fast food restaurant today is actually the size of the adult meal in 1950. And wow. that's extraordinary to people because I'm staying at a very nice hotel this week where the hamburgers are all half pound hamburgers. And every time I see that, I think who is eating this giant portion of hamburger? Because I, I don't want to eat that much hamburger. So, um, and, and human evolution is very slow. But in one century, Glenda, in four generations, we've gone from people who routinely walked eight miles a day and people who consumed a pound and a half of sugar per year. Per people year. ate freshly grown foods, they grew their own foods or they knew who they were buying their food from. Their chickens ate bugs and grasses, which are what chickens are supposed to eat. They, their cattle or, or animals that they ate were freshly produced by them or near them. Their milk might have even been their own milk. And, in, and, and yet these people did all of this work and ate much smaller portions of food and calories than we did. And at the same time, since I have been in school and I graduated high school in 79, we have stopped physical education in high schools as a mandatory thing we must take, which just blows my mind because physical education is something I've got to use the rest of my life. And at the same time, we discovered video games. And the result of that is I am at the very end of the baby boomers and my generation moves 80% less than my grandparents did, but I still move more than teenagers do. And today's teenager eats 154 pounds of processed sugar a year. And so we believe aging will go backwards for the first time in 300 years because we move less in the introduction, introduction of so much sugar and so much um, processed foods. We are the most overweight, over-medicated, and least moving people in history. And this happened very quickly. This is a shot from the 1930s. This is the 1960s. By the 1970s, you were starting to see bellies show in the 80s. And then in 53 years, we went from this very famous shot at the space shuttle or at the um, liftoff of Apollo to today's crowd at a football game, which is a lot of obesity and the body mass index is out of balance. So Glenda, I wasn't moving enough before the pandemic. I don't no. know if you noticed that, but the couch potato actually has a little tiny pizza box there. <laughs> COVID hasn't helped. People have been afraid to get out. Um, dementia family caregivers have been basically locked down. One of the things humans do do when we're panicked, when we're grief stricken, when we're full of anxiety and depression is we do eat for comfort. Um, I'm part of the clean plate club, Glenda. I was raised that it was a terrible thing to not eat everything on your plate. It's very difficult for me to order at a restaurant and cut half the food in half and put it away. I'm like, ah, but you still have to do it. That giant big gulp is actually like 3000 calories of soda, 
we are drinking more alcohol, go Texas, and we're eating more processed foods. And all of those things have increased during COVID. People are so stressed out that they don't cook for themselves. It's, it, it is how much stress we're under. The body max index is um, a height to weight ratio formula that it's also determined by your age and it tells you how much fat your body is carrying. And um, it is certainly affected by where you live. There are areas of the country where uh, you are very much looked down upon for smoking. And there are areas of the country where smoking is part of regular life. Uh, there are areas of the country where food, uh, you can find vegetarian or vegan restaurants. There are areas of the country where I believe in Texas, if we could figure out how to bread and deep fry water, we would do it. Um, there are places where you drive there are places you live where you walk everywhere. There um, are people who have gotten more and more sedentary. When I visited Italy, when I was in um, college, I was astonished that this 80 year old couple climbed seven floors to their house every day, multiple times a day, because the thought of doing that was just horrifying to me. And now I realize how much better shape they were in because it almost killed me when I did it and I was 21, I should have been in shape. Um, it is that we eat a lot more red meat. Um, a routine serving of steak and fine dining is like a pound and a half ribeye and people eat it. Um, we eat less vegetables, whereas before meat was so expensive, Glenda, we really all did get a small percentage of, of meat and the rest of our food was made up of vegetables. Um, uh, and then we have higher levels of homocysteine, which is a hormone in your body that can make you appear to have dementia when you don't. So things in our bodies are affected by what we're doing to it, what we're not doing for it, what we inherited, and then also it's affected by where we live. And that, Glenda, for all of that lecture brought us all back to vascular dementia. So what vascular dementia means is that something is happening to the brain that is stopping blood flow. And that is going to be something that's some sort of cerebrovascular disease or cardiovascular disease. It is the second most common named dementia, but once combined with another dementia, it becomes mixed dementia. And the most common mixed dementia is Alzheimer's and vascular dementia. The families are under a great deal of stress they typically um, find that their person is not correctly diagnosed. And so the information that they're getting on Alzheimer's doesn't apply to their person. And so it can feel very, very weird to them. Signs and symptoms of vascular dementia, that concentration, community, communication seems impaired. Uh, there are memory problems, but short-term memory it, it may not be affected. Um, there begin to be changes where they either begin to walk too fast or they begin to shuffle. Uh, there begin to be symptoms like stroke. Um, and a stroke, Glenda, most strokes occur in the middle of the night. Most strokes are transient ischemic attacks. Um, most strokes, the stroke would feel like a headache, but I hate to say that because I don't want you to have a headache and think you're having a stroke. Um, vascular dementia can cause personality changes, but normally it just kind of enhances uh, that person. Um, there can be depression and irritability, and a lot of times these get untreated because irritable people folks tend to avoid, and depression in people with dementia is angry, annoyed, agitated, and aggressive. And so instead of seeking treatment for depression, this person ends up being shunned by the staff or by caregivers or by family, instead of realizing there's something wrong with my person we can treat. Um, frequently in dementia, urinary incontinence begins in stage five and bowel incontinence begins in stage six. But in vascular dementia, urinary and bowel incontinence can begin much earlier as the result of some type of, of stroke activity. Now, vascular dementia is typically diagnosed by using CT scans because they can make the horizontal and axle images, which give the doctor that picture of the slice of the brain. The PET scan uh, uses special dye to light up regions of the brain that would indicate there's been stroke there. 
uh, EEG measures electrical activity in the brain. And if there's an area where there's no electricity going through, that's an indicator something has happened. The MRI is the one where you lay in the tube and these are difficult for your loved ones to do. Most of these tests are, are pretty fast, but the MRI is a, about an hour of them laying very perfectly still, not moving, not turning their head while they listen to something going dong. It's to me, it's like being inside of a big bell dong every few minutes. So your loved one may not be able to do an MRI or they may have metal in their body and couldn't do an MRI. But the MRI is the one that makes the three dimensional picture of the brain that allows the doctors to see if there have been strokes or infarcts whether there have been transient ischemic attacks, whether there is ischemic damage in the white matter, whether there is damage in the gray matter, it gives the doctor the full picture of what they're seeing, including whether or not the brain has shrunken and how much volume loss there is. The neuropsych testing is a terrible day for your loved ones. So on the day they have to do that, they're gonna be angry when they come out. They're gonna be flustered and frustrated. Do something nice for them that day, a nice meal, whatever will make them feel better because that's a hard and stressful day of people reading them paragraphs and then expecting them to be able to answer it. And they're doing it to figure out what areas of the brain are damaged. The next one is the HIS, the Hachinsky Ischemic Scale. Now, Glenda, this is looking for, for types of, for, for stroke activity, an abrupt onset and change in mental status. When a family tells me on August 16th, mama changed, it may not have been a stroke large enough to put her in the hospital, but it was the stroke that put her brain over the edge. So we know with TIAs, you may have dozens of those, Glenda. So the first 12 didn't make a difference, but the 13th one puts you over the edge. The person has that stepwise deterioration. Instead of going down the slippery slope, they're stepping down. They tend to be more confused at nighttime. Um, a lot of complaints that the doctor won't be able to find necessarily something definitive but they're feeling pain and you wanna treat them for pain. They may have emotional incontinence, which means they may just suddenly tell you everything they need or there may be sudden outburst of uh, laughter or crying. And then there's usually a history of hypertension, a history of stroke and evidence of uh, cardiovascular conditions. And you've got to think Folks, when the doctor says, is there a history of cardiovascular stuff, that includes things like heart attacks, heart replacements, valve replacements, bypasses, quintuple bypasses, shunt stents. Glenda, I ask people, has there been any heart or, or cardiovascular stuff? And they'll say no. And then you'll find out later on, they smoked cigarettes until they had a full quintuple bypass. The doctor needs to know that because anything cardiovascular is going to help move the, the doctor to paying a lot of attention to whether or not this is vascular dementia. Now, as the disease attacks the different lobes of the brain, you get somewhat different behaviors or movements than if it was simply Alzheimer's disease. So in the frontal lobe, an unsteady gait and muscular rigidity. Um, you may see paralysis. And this is, Glenda, when we think about somebody having a massive stroke on this side that literally paralyzes one side, but it can leave some eye and head movement paralysis, um, an inability to use speech because speech is in our frontal lobes. Um, when people tend to have seizures after vascular dementia, the seizures are frequently frontal lobe seizures. And because it's the frontal lobe, Glenda, and the frontal lobe is what makes you, you, and me, me, this is where my personality is, this is where rational thought is, rational thought says, don't take off your clothes right now, you're in a room full of people, rational thought says, don't say everything you think, I can suddenly become full of rage, or I can appear to have a total lack of initiative, concern, and just be apathetic and have no emotion on my face. And when this lobe gets damaged, it's 
it, it's not unusual for a family caregiver to think my person no longer loves me. But what you're really witnessing is not a lack of love. You're witnessing somebody with brain damage in that area of the brain. Now, the temporal lobes are hearing, language, smell, memory. Remember, the left temporal lobe is formal language. The right temporal lobe is singing and cussing. The left temporal lobe tends to die first. And this is deafness without needing hearing aids. And Glenda, we all know, or y'all should know, in stage five and stage six, they're going to throw the hearing aids away. And before they throw them away, they're going to wrap them several times in tissue and tuck them in the trash so that we'll never see them. But again, it's not that I need hearing aids. It's this area of the brain which translates what I was hearing. It's not unusual, Glenda, for people to develop tinnitus. And we think as the baby boomer last group gets there, we're going to have tinnitus because we got stereo speakers, Glenda, and we got headsets so we could put that in. We got to big concerts where they blew really loud music at us. There is, as the disease continues, an inability to understand language. And if the person learned multiple languages, they begin to go back to their primary language. There can be trouble with music in vascular dementia, whereas in an Alzheimer's or the other dementias, music would still be very clear. If it's not to the person with vascular dementia, it's an indicator that there's been damage on that right temporal lobe as well. And then you have memory loss. And because of damage here, people with vascular dementia may have hallucinations that are more complex that go on for a long uh, even an hour of time and may have a lot of stuff involved with them and the parietal lobe um, impaired touch happens uh, if strokes hit their impaired ability to to see where i am actually in relation to the chair around me uh, loss of the ability to, to write or read or calculate but glenda if I was always a lifetime reader and I always had a book in my pocket, I'm going to continue to carry that book in my pocket. I'll even turn it open and people will think I'm reading and I may be reading a word that doesn't mean I can comprehend it. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. And, and we see the same thing with somebody who always read the newspaper at breakfast. They'll read that and it looks like they're reading it, but they're really just doing the motions and not quite comprehending it. Um, I begin to get lost in places where I should know stuff. It's difficult for me to identify things by touching them, and that's something you and I should be able to do. And then because of stroke activity, I may not see certain parts of my body or I may neglect certain parts of my body because I just am not aware that they're there anymore. But again, it's all brain damage. Strokes in the occipital lobe mean loss of vision and visual fields. And this is one of the first things that doctors will check on somebody who has a stroke history is they're gonna check to see what is their visual field? How far around them can they actually see? And in dementia, because of damage there, people begin to see peripherally, then they see you through a periscope. And when I look at you through a periscope, Glenda, I can't see the food in front of me, but I can see your food. Mm. And I've got damage up here from something that happened. So if I see your food, I'm going to go get your food because I don't see my own food and I'm hungry. And that's something families see and they think, oh, my person's terrible. And what it says to us is damage back here. There continues to be damage to where in vascular dementia, they could lose vision on the left side or the right side, just if a stroke hit at the right place. And because damage would be here, here, and here at this point, there would be trouble recognizing family members who you actually are. And then the objects don't necessarily appear at the right distance from us. And things can be smaller or larger than we think they are. Uh, some people see flashes. I personally, Glenda, have never run into somebody who says they see flashes, but it's, it's listed in our criteria. So they, your loved one might see spots or dots of uh, light in front of them or things zigging by them. I would certainly make my doctor aware of that if I saw that. Now, there are four common signs uh, or four common forms of uh, dementia. The biggest one is multi-infarct vascular dementia, which means multiple stroke dementia. 
and the most common strokes are the TIA strokes. So this might be somebody who has had dozens of strokes. It's the cumulative effect of that number of strokes that set off the vascular dementia. And then of course you'd be watching for the onset of Alzheimer's. Benzwanger dementia is uh, one where the vessels, the, the small blood vessels don't quite get oxygenated blood to the areas of the brain that it, that it needs to get to. And then single strategic infarct means that there was a massive stroke that happened in the middle of part of the brain. And then small vessel disease, this would be where I would be looking for things like uh, white matter on the uh, MRI. Is there a white matter disease? Are there white matter hyperintensitivities? What is going wrong with the small vessels? And it will usually say chronic small vessel disease, Glenda, on the MRI, but no one ever tells the family they're talking about yeah. vascular dementia. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, these are different types of, of strokes and things that you see. They're trying to give you an idea of what each of these looks like as they train physicians to be able to recognize these different ones. And um, you can tell just from the drawings, these show up differently on MRIs. So on MRIs, the number one with the large infarcts would show that there's an area of the brain there that's not there. Others would show little tiny dots. Others would show complete areas gone. So the different image that the doctor is looking at tells them what type of um, stroke your person has had. And that then would give you an idea of which type of dementia your loved one would have. Now, multi-infarct dementia may be written as multi-infarct vascular dementia. It may be written as MID. It may be written as multiple stroke dementia. So you see, Glenda, part of the reason for the family's confusion and the professional's yeah. confusion is nobody has said, this is exactly what we're gonna call it. We're not gonna call it anything else. So it is multiple infarcts where the blood, where the vessel was actually blocked by a clot. That's an occlusion, the clot, and that caused the stroke. And it would be a large one or it would be multiple ones. And the big infarcts are the ones that have the big clots that are in large to medium sized blood vessels. The TIAs are in the teeny tiny blood vessels. Now, as I say that Glenda, remember that you have 100,000 miles of blood vessels in your brain. And that's why those TIAs, those transient ischemic attacks, that's why a person can have dozens of those and it's only the next one that finally shows that something's wrong with the brain. Does, does that make sense? Because you're yeah. dealing with something just so tiny. The impairment can be across multiple domains, which means it could interfere with cognition and short-term memory and long-term memory and sensory memory. It could interfere with the person's ability to move their body. And they could at the same time have strokes happen and not have the loss of visual field or not have movement or gait challenges. And the family will think they've completely recovered. And it may be the next one that causes everybody to then realize they've now crossed a line. Benzwanger is there are strokes that, um, remember that's the chronic small vessel disease. The strokes are happening in the white matter of the brain. Uh, gray matter is what we think of, Glenda, with the brain, but on the interior of it is the white matter. White matter is called that because the neurons are sheathed in white myelin. Um, well, in myelin and myelin is white, but that is where the neurons begin to make the connectivity into the nerves that will run down through our body. And that's where the brain begins to run the body. That's how the body operates is through that white matter. And so in Benzwanger, you've got high blood pressure, the artery walls begin to get too thick so there's not enough blood flow going through and the person will appear slow, they'll appear lethargic, they may sleep a lot. Um, very early, they begin to lose control of bladder and bowel and they may have emotional ups and downs, uh, depression and anxiety, all as the result of this inadequate blood flow that begins. 
And this Glenda is um, a, a dementia we see in people in their 40s. It's not unusual. Um, this is not normally a dementia we would see in somebody um, over the age of say 65. This is thought to be a dementia of a younger person. Strategic single infarct, um, the, the lesions or the, the stroke occurred in the areas of the brain where there is higher cognitive function. And so that would mean the areas of the brain that help us learn, help us learn new information and also help keep us in balance and help keep us move. And so having the type of dementia means your loved one's not gonna move the same as other people. That means they're going to have, um, gonna to need to be watched closer for any type of skin breakdown and make sure that they're getting the uh, chair exercise to help them stay as limber and as range of motion movable as possible. But it also means that they've got things happening in their brain that have caused these strokes to happen. They had lesions in their brain. So they had little dead areas in their brain that began to accumulate because of the strokes. And then finally, there was one big stroke that uh, is what caused your person to tip over. I don't feel like I'm explaining that well enough. Um, cerebral small vessel disease is an umbrella term. And it is one of the more common terms that we hear in vascular dementia. And when I look on MRIs and I'm helping a family understand what the MRI actually says, Glenda, these are the words that I'm looking for. I'm looking to see if the doctor found any of these things in that MRI summary report because the, the doctor thinks that the family clearly understands that I just told you vascular dementia with cerebral small ves vessel disease. And the family has no idea that that's what's on that report. So look for any words on your MRI report. If your loved one has had an MRI, look up the words you don't understand. Trust me, somebody has put them on the internet. Look up the words and you will figure it out like a jigsaw puzzle of what they're telling you. And if you don't have time to do that, call me and I'll help you figure out what it says. But any of these things written down on the MRI are clearly telling you this is vascular dementia and this is the form. And Glenda, I want to know the form because I want my doctor to know this is what my mother has because I don't want it. Does, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Exactly. You've got to you've got to be an advocate and figure all this out. And protect yourself. And this is the dementia we can protect from. You've got to be aware of cerebral vascular disease. And if the doctor says your loved one has these things, these are all things that lead to people having strokes. These are all things that lead to clots breaking off. Um, there are things that lead to the brain not getting enough oxygenated blood. And so it can simply be those things that cause your loved one's vascular dementia to begin to happen. Now, when I was growing up, Glenda, this one, I'll go back for just a second, arteriosclerosis. When I was growing up, we only had two dementias. We had senility, which was Alzheimer's disease, and we had arteriosclerosis, but we called it hardening of the arteries because as the plaque built up, those arteries became stiff. Now, if you have a doctor who uses those two terms, you need to run and go get another doctor. Shouldn't be using those. Um, the uh, technology that your ER room has, the technology at your doctor's fingertips allows them to look at your loved one's brain with different tests and determine the type of stroke they had, where the stroke was, how much brain was damaged. And so strokes, uh, there, there are multiple, multiple types of strokes. Uh, ischemic stroke means that, that that clot broke off and traveled to a blood vessel until it reached a blood vessel that it couldn't get down and it blocked blood flow and that's where the stroke occurred. Hemorrhagic stroke means the blood vessel actually ruptured. And most people don't survive those strokes, Glenda, because blood is rushing into the brain and it, and it kills the brain because it compacts it. But other strokes can occur in any area of the brain. And a stroke feels like a headache, but at the same time I say that, if I have a headache, immediately stick your tongue out. If you can stick your tongue out, it's a headache, not a stroke. 
but there are also some rare forms of Alzheimer's where the person has intense headaches as a sign of their dementia. So be alert to headaches, but be alert that a stroke feels like a headache, but a headache doesn't mean a stroke. That's what I wanted you to get out of that, Glenda. Got it. Um, and then the stroke occurs because the uh, body was unable to get oxygenated blood to go to every area of the brain. And when that oxygenated blood stopped going, if it stopped long enough, then that area where blood was expected immediately in front of that clot, that area and the areas that are fed by that die if the uh, clot is not broken up in time. And depending upon the type of stroke and the size of the blood vessel, it determines how bad the stroke is gonna be how quickly it will take your person to recover and how much they will be able to recover. And it's all based on the, the size of the clot, how far the clot got and how long before clot busting drugs were introduced to the person, how long before they got to the hospital, other medications that they were on. All of those things would, would determine how bad the stroke was. Now these are infarcts and um, this is what they look like on the brain. These are, uh, just the brain cells that were there, whatever information they carried, it no longer exists. So remember, just like in Alzheimer's, your person is not doing things on purpose, even though it can look like it, and they're not doing things to aggravate or bother you, even though they might be doing that. They're not pretending, they're not acting like, they're not lying, they're not showing off. They're simply responding to brain damage. It's just their brain damage is different than the Alzheimer's brain damage. Their brain damage is occurring based on what area of the brain is going through these different cardiovascular things that are happening to them. So it could be throughout the brain. It could be only in the gray matter. It could be only in the white matter. It could be on the top of the brain. It could be on the interior of the brain. It could be as far down as the brain stem. It just depends on where it is, and that's why it's important to know what your lobes are. Now, other signs of vascular dementia are sudden confusion, trouble paying attention and concentrating, decline in their ability to think through a situation, to be able to plan and use their executive function. Their thinking seems slower to you, and not slower because they're thinking longer about it, slower because they can't keep up with what you're doing. Beginning to get more and more disorganized, the house usually begins to look a little disheveled. There begin to be problems with memory. The short-term memory now begins to show. And remember, more restlessness, more verbal and physical agitation. One of the things I ask people to do, Glenda, when I see them is let me see you walk because mm -hmm. I'm looking to see is the gate steady or are we leaning off to one side? Do we look like we're, we're out of balance? Signs for family, sudden and frequent urges to urinate that just came out of nowhere. Normally incontinence, uh, bladder incontinence, Glenda be begins with my person had an accident. And then about a month later, they had another accident. And now slowly over the last six months, it's become now to where I have to remind them to go to the bathroom or they'll have an accident. And then suddenly I realize they no longer are able to control their bladder. In vascular dementia, this is very sudden and very rapid. Your person goes from being able to control their bladder one day to now they're, they're, they're not able to control it. And there's an urge to go to the bathroom that is much greater than what was normal for them. And then we know depression, anxiety, and apathy. Risk factors are we get older. Well, Glenda, there's a, a, you know, there's a downside to not getting older. <laughs> Well, yeah. Um, history of cardiovascular disease and strokes. And so in my family, we have a large number of family members that dropped dead at 40. And um, my grandmother died of vascular disease. My mother has vascular disease. My younger sister has been on blood pressure medicine since she was in her 20s. That's not normal. My family has a history of cardiovascular disease and strokes. And so we would be primed to develop vascular dementia. Um, we have people that have inherited their blood cells aren't aging correctly. 
And then you could be this big around Glenda and run marathons, but you might've inherited high cholesterol or high blood pressure. And all of those are part of the risk factors. And then I could add more. I can take up smoking, not take care of my body, obesity. You might have atrial fibrillation, which means the heart's really, really in pain. You've got to be aware of sleep apnea, diabetes, got to follow the diabetes diet. And if you really want to be in good shape, use the diabetes diet or the heart diet or the Mediterranean diet. Even if you don't have diabetes, use those diets. People with a history of strokes and TIAs, people with heart disease, people with um, heart rhythm abnormalities. There are inherited forms. Catacil is inherited. Um, this again is one of the dementias that strikes people in their 40s. This is thought to be inherited on the male side of the family, but a whole lot is not known about it. The person just suddenly develops this dementia and is usually gone within uh, three to five years till the end of life. And then in Alzheimer's dementia, the life expectancy is about five years after the person is diagnosed. And that is because they're not diagnosed until the very end of the disease. In vascular dementia, the life expectancy is about five years after the symptoms began. So it's a different, um, way to look at it or think about it, but it's because the person's cardiovascular system is damaged. Does, does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. Okay, I've depressed everyone, so. Well, no, I, I, I don't think that this is, let, let me put it this way, one of the most depressing presentations you've done. Uh, so I don't quite know I, how to what, that good. I know, I know. So I'm going to go through the questions that we have received in the chat box. And so if you have not put a question there and you have a question, just hang on a moment and we'll see if we can get to everybody. Um, let's see. I'm going down here. I work with a client. Uh, let me back up. And I read these. I know you can see them on Zoom, but we have people that have dialed in on their telephone and they can't see. Them. So I, that's why I'm reading them. I work with a client whose father has vascular dementia. She has explained to me that her father demands she take him to the airport on a daily basis. She's tried redirection and it, is, it does not work because he does not forget when she says she will take him later or tomorrow. Sounds pretty complicated. Any suggestions on how to better handle this type of situation? Doesn't seem her father forgets so easily. That was from Monica. Um, I would talk to the doctor about anxiety and I would use the words anxiety. I would use the words agitated. I would use um, the words angry, but I would keep bringing it back to, he sounds to me like he's got acute anxiety. He, he needs to leave. He's trying to leave. But if I just say that the doctor's going to go, we'll tell him he can't leave. But if I present it as anxiety, so go to the scale ham a, which is capital H capital a capital M dash capital a it's the Hamilton anxiety scale and see if any of that looks like your dad. And those are the phrases I would use talking to the doctor. Okay. Okay, and also look and see, Glenda, is there a certain time where this behavior started? Does it indicate that another stroke has occurred? Yeah, yeah. Um, Natalie asks, is paranoia a symptom or side effect of vascular dementia? My father experiences that a lot, especially during sundown. It's very normal as part of sundowning and it's very normal as part of dementia. And also if your dad has hearing impairment or vision impairment, they are more paranoid um, because they can't understand the world around them. So try talking slower, try moving slower and talk to the doctor about an anxiety medication. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe for you and, the, and dad, you know. <laughs> <laughs> might get a two for one we don't know but but try that and see how that works okay thank you so much thanks natalie and everybody you really can call me if you've if it doesn't work call me back and we'll figure out something else if you uh glenda will put my number in the box it's two five four already have 
Oh, oh well, <laughs> call me anyway. But for those of you at home, uh, those of you on your telephone, uh, to reach Tam, you can call her at 254-216-3668. Um, okay, Angie says, my mother has problems sleeping throughout the night. After going to the restroom in the middle of the night, she will go to the living room to look out of the window or go to the dining room or kitchen to organize the tables. Is this common in vascular dementia? Uh-huh. <laughs> so, yeah, they get up and get busy in the middle of the night. These are not slackers. Um, you could talk to the doctor and ask about adding something like melatonin, um, a chamomile tea. Uh, if she were in a community, they would make her a tea and then lead her back to bed. They, mm -hmm. they would do something with her with a little bit and then, and then, then put her back to bed. But she's doing a normal behavior that is seen. What you want to make sure is that she doesn't leave the house. So to secure the house, we put a lock at the top of the door because none of us were ever trained to open a door by looking at the top for a lock. So it's just a simple latch. Then before we had alarm systems in nursing homes, we used to to put a three foot black rug in front of every exit door because a person with dementia wouldn't step across that rug. It looks like a big hole. Huh. And then we also ask grandchildren to paint a giant stop sign. And we put that stop sign on any door. We don't want them to exit so that when you go to sleep at night, that person can't actually get out of your house, which means you're more likely to be able to get a good night's sleep. You can also do things like get a baby monitor and put a baby monitor in their room so that you can hear them moving around in the night. If it becomes an issue, uh, we would put an alarm on the bed. And when your mother gets off the bed, it would set off a 90 decibel alarm, which is like having the fire truck in your room turning on its alarm. So you can look at several different things to do. Uh, one is if she can't get out of the house and she can't turn the stove on. So you'll need to have an electrician come and fix a switch so she can't turn the stove on because they get up and cook in the middle of the night. They're just not safe. But otherwise, she's just doing what is normal. Angie, you unmuted your phone. Did you have a comment on what you had written in the chat box? Yes. Um, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, I already have the latch and I'm able to um, disable the stove. And um, she does drink the chamomile tea and the melatonin, the other suggestions I haven't put um, tried yet. So thank you very much. So one of those would be looking at getting her bladder empty before she goes to bed at night, okay? So an older bladder is a folded bladder. It's, it's not springy. So the way we teach a professional staff to do this is you set the mother on the toilet and she pees and you think her bladder emptied, but it didn't because it's folded and olded. So now we brush her teeth, we wash her face and we wash her hands and put her back on the toilet. And that introduction of water should cause the bladder to constrict. She pees, she's actually emptied her bladder. That mm -hmm. gives you a much longer window of time for her to get through the night, but that's the first step. So the first step was getting her bladder empty. Now we're gonna set her in bed. And when my mother went to bed, her mother had spent all day Monday scrubbing and ironing sheets. So you didn't go to bed with dirty feet. This generation washed their child's feet before they put them in bed. So we tell the staff, take a warm washcloth and as your mother sits on the side of the bed, wash your mother's feet. Number one, it feels wonderful and it helps her relax. Number two, it lets you clean her feet. And number three, it feels wonderful. If you've never had that done for you, make a note, Glenda, do it for yourself tonight. Everybody wash their feet tonight. You will feel wonderful when you go to bed. Okay. Now we tuck her in and we say her prayer. Now, Angie, she may ask you to say the prayer and she'll recite it after you. She may say the prayer and you stand there. You may say the prayer and she may recite each line after you. And then you kiss her on the forehead and you say the magic phrase, good night, I'll see you in the morning. And what that phrase means is don't get out of bed. That's what that phrase <laughs> means. Because daddy's in the house and daddy's only pray with one hand, which is you will go to sleep right now. So those are the, the steps that we tell a professional staff to do, to tuck a person in at night and give them the best opportunity to sleep through the night. Okay. 
Thank you very much. It's interesting. She does wash her wash her feet every night. She started that on her own. Ah. So thank you very much. She's simply it's gone funny. back in time to where she knows that's what you do. So you, her exactly. mama would have tucked her in, like we tuck in a tuck in a baby, would have washed her feet and tucked her into bed. Okay. Yeah. Thank and you. And you do it tonight too. It feels fabulous. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks, Angie. Um, Richard said, I knew a client who would forget to stand. So at any given time, he would collapse on the ground. Would that have been a symptom of Ben Swingers? Uh, no, that, first of all, he didn't forget how to stand. That's his brain not working. Hmm. And based on whether he crumpled to the ground or he fell like a plank, if he fell forward or backward like a plank, that would be Lewy bodies or Parkinson's. If he crumpled to the ground, I would think of vascular because um, they can suddenly have that piece of the brain cut off and drop as a result. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not sure about Ben's longer, uh, but it would certainly seem a, a bit vascular. It would depend on how he fell, but it wasn't that he forgot, it's, it's brain damage. Right. That's what we've got to help everybody realize. They're not yeah. pretending. They're not faking. They're not forgetting that piece of their brain doesn't connect right now. Right. We can we need to keep telling that message over and over and over again. This is brain damage. It's nothing other than that. Um, Linda asked, my husband recently had a brain view test. I'm not sure what that is, but you may know, Tam. The had a brain what? A brain view, V-I-E-W. The doctor is supposed to call and give us results. Are there any questions that, sh that we should ask about? And does it help determine if he's had TIAs or strokes? I I'm not sure I, what a brain view is. I don't know what a brain view is. The only thing I know that's a brain view is an MRI or a CAT scan. And what I would ask is, is there anything that shows atrophy, volume loss, a lesion or a stroke? Is there anything? thing that y'all should be concerned about yeah and then linda, let us know what that is yeah i'm dying to know what that is yeah linda are you still with us and can you unmute your phone and kind of tell us why and she's got it in quotation marks and so i'm i'm thinking that's exactly what she was told is a brain view but maybe it's a brain view mri um okay well let's let's move forward and see what else we have here um People want to know if they can get the slide presentation. I have not seen this one before myself, Tam. Are you going to share that with us? Oh, sure, sure, sure. Okay, good. Um, so let me get to that right now. So after the call in a few days, you'll receive a follow-up email if you have registered for the call. Um, it will be attached to that and any other information resources that we want to share with you. Um, this is Linda, um, if you if you want oh, to talk about there the brain view. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I looked it up. It's an EEG and an ECG and um, some visual and auditory processing speeds. So it's, it's a combination of uh, the EEG and the ECG. Interesting. Interesting. Well, Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, yeah and he said it's new technology them. and that it was so, com he actually sent on the portal the results of it, but he said they're too complicated for us to understand and <clears throat> it'd be lengthy, so he's going to call us in an evening, but we haven't heard the interpretation yet. I just wondered what we should be I, I asking. Would, yeah, I would think ask him if he sees anything that, that makes him alarmed. Um, does he see anything that gives indication of a, of a stroke or a, a lesion? Is there any volume loss? Uh, the, is there anything that they see that, that's abnormal? Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm interested as to, to what they say because it, this is, uh, it's interesting. Interesting what yeah, they're it's our cardiologist. You can see what information it gives you. Yeah. It was the cardiologist that recommended it. I would also recommend, Linda, that if there's any way for you to tape that conversation so that you can oh, go back and listen again. Very good. Uh, in case you've missed something, um, if you can do that, I think that would help you a lot, too. Great and idea. And you can do that on your iPhone, right, Linda? Can't you turn yes. on a voice memo or something? I think sure. so. Yeah. yeah. I, I or the video, even. Is, yeah, it's so complicated that you may need to listen to it several times to, to glean the information that you're Good watching. Good point. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. 
Okay. Especially um, since he's already reported out, mere mortals like you and me can't understand. It. So exactly, I think it'd be best if, if we all recorded it together. Exactly. Well, it was Andy said it's so long that he couldn't do it in an office. Uh, right. Office visit is going to be at night when he had more time. That's, that's now, it. if he shows up at your house with wine and roses, Linda, you need to call the law. I'm just going to throw that out right there. Yeah. He's an excellent cardiologist. We've been with okay. him 25 years. Yeah. Okay. Well, then we trust him. We trust you him. You need well, to report yeah. back to us, Linda, on that one for sure. Okay. We'll do. Absolutely. Okay. We wish you the best and keep you in our prayers. <laughs> that's right. Uh, Ann wants to know, is aphasia only common in, um, I'm, she says AD, so I'm assuming it's Alzheimer's and not vascular dementia. And we've been hearing a lot about aphasia on the news because one of our longtime actors has been suffering with aphasia. So start again with the question, because as soon as you said aphasia, I went, poor Bruce Willis. Oh, yeah. Well, there you go. Is aphasia only common for Alzheimer's dementia, not vascular dementia? Actually, aphasia is is a frontal temporal dementia. And what I haven't understood is why they haven't admitted which form of frontal temporal dementia he has. So it's either primary progressive aphasia, semantic dementia, or logopenic variant, um, which are subsets of primary progressive aphasia. And then if it's primary progressive aphasia, is it a, a fluent or non-fluent? So um, they haven't made, um, as far as I know, they haven't said which one it is, but on Linda Ronstadt, they've never identified that she has a frontal temporal dementia. So I don't know if it's the stigma. I, I don't quite understand um, what, what, what has happened to him. It's obviously, you know, we all love Bruce Willis. Well, that was, that was me and not Ann. And so you, your answer then is it's, common in any kind of dementia depending on where the damage is is that right am I understanding you right Tim no no it is you people with Alzheimer's lose their ability to use language and speech people with vascular dementia can have a stroke and use lose their language or speech but people with uh, frontal temporal dementia in the communication disorder group that communication disorder group is primary progressive aphasia primary progressive aphasia, semantic dementia form, logopenic variant, primary progressive aphasia. Okay. And so when they said aphasia and you look at his age, your first thought is this is a frontal temporal dementia. I don't understand why it has only been announced as aphasia. I assume the family just wants to keep some things private. Yeah. But that's yeah. not something that we think of with Alzheimer's or with vascular. Although we use the term aphasia to mean the inability to use and understand uh, words or language or speech. Got it. Got it. Thanks, Ann, for that question. Um, Kim, Kim wanted to know how she can listen to the, the replay. She came in late. Kim and others, these will be made podcast and they will put on the Caregiver Teleconnection website, www dot caregiver teleconnection a one word caregiver teleconnection dot org and you can go to that site and uh, listen to any of the podcasts that we've been doing for many years now um and um wants to know what's a good medication for depression for someone with vascular dementia i was gonna say bourbon but i know that's wrong Linda. i know that's wrong 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 and so don't wrong, listen wrong. To me. don't listen to me um you're gonna want to talk to your doctor about that um what the doctor's looking for is how your loved one presents and then the type of medication that they use is determined based on whether they think your brain is producing enough serotonin not producing enough serotonin it's producing it the cells are using it but they're not releasing it or it's producing enough the cells are using it they're releasing it but the next cell is not reuptaking it so that's a question for your doctor as to which medication would they feel best for your loved one right uh Seema, and yes i recognize you for being on here uh she wanted to know about um ceus we don't offer ceus we can get you a certificate of attendance um, for uh, being on the session today, if you'll just call the number for our customer service representative, she can get that for you. And it's toll free at 
Uh, thanks for asking that question, Seema. Um, let's see. Condi says, my mom has had two strokes, the first many years ago and the last big one about 10 years ago. She seems to recover but had delusional memory since the last stroke. Her memories often have some truth but then go off the rails. Two years ago, she became severely confused and started suffering from auditory hallucinations. She became completely disabled for a period of time, then kind of bounced back up, but not to normal. She still has the auditory hallucinations and is easily agitated. We have now placed her into memory care, and she seems much happier. Her doctor never had, ne had noticed the dementia before her breakdown. I think she has had the vascular dementia since the last stroke, and it seems to be mixed with Alzheimer's now. She's 80. Does this seem reasonable? It does. It does. It, it seems reasonable. And I'm sorry y'all have gone through this for so long and you figured all this out on your, on your own. So good for you. And she's calmer and happier where she is. So good for you. Good right. for you. You did good. You have to go now, write yourself a letter. Uh, <laughs> this is for all of y'all. You have to write yourself a letter about what a good caregiver you've been. And this is a, a case of it right here. And it's been all of you. So yeah. your homework tonight and Glenda will come to your house and beat you herself in person if you don't. Um, write yourself a letter tonight about what a tremendously loyal and good caregiver you've been. Even when you've had moments where you pulled your hair out and wanted to bite through nails, you, you've still been a good, a good caregiver. And write yourself that letter because in time, it will be something you cherish. That's right. And you deserve that thinking of yourself in that way. Uh, Tony says, my mom casts before bed every night, but she still gets up two or three times to pee. Hmm. And? And there was mother a has a bladder the size of a bird. My grandmother had a bladder the size of a bird. My mother has a bladder the size of a bird. I myself have a bladder only the size of a bird. Um, <laughs> a part of it can be your, you know, if it was a perfect world, we'd all be doing our Kegel exercises and your mother's bladder would be fabulous, but it just isn't. So um, I would get a chuck from medical supply house. I'd get three or four of them. I'd put those under her so that when she starts not making that out of bed, you don't have the whole bed ruined. And then I just, uh, you can set up a bedside toilet right next to her bed, if that's easier for her. But some people just go to the bathroom throughout the night and it's just their little bladder. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see. This is Seema again, and she says, my mother had COVID eight months ago and feels like she's developed dementia. Not sure if she had had it before or not. She recovered from COVID. Problem now is she recently started walking with a walker from being bed bound. She goes to the bathroom during the day, however, has urine incontinence during the night. She is completely soaked in the morning with two diapers and other linings. Whole bed gets wet too. Any advice on that particular situation? You, you need a bed chuck. You, you need a chuck on the bed and you need to look at when is she getting her fluid because to have that much fluid comes out at, come out at night means that y'all need to look at when is she taking in fluid and we want to encourage her to take in more fluid earlier in the day and not so much right at the end of the day. Okay, so in a community, they would immediately begin to look at when are they giving her fluid? How much fluid are they giving her? The other thing is... It, it, it get a chuck get a couple of chucks these are going to be uh, rubberized on one end and they're like quilted white uh, blankets on the other end and you put those across the bed and instead of washing the whole bed ruining a mattress and she lays in pee all night the the chuck absorbs the urine and you only have to wash the chucks not not the whole bed I also I, I really would look at why is she getting so much fluid so late in the evening? Okay, is it medication? Is she getting a diuretic in the evening and she should be getting the diuretic in the morning? Is she taking heart medication in the evening and we really need to take it in the morning? So let's ask the doctor 
uh, look at her medicines or the pharmacist, which ones uh, are any of these making her pee at night and can any of these be moved? And then look at when are we giving mom fluid that's making her do this and look at if you can adjust that. Yeah. Um, Sandy had a couple of things here, but we're really long as we usually are. And she had mentioned an external catheter has been a lifesaver for her during the night. Um, so there is something for women also, is there not these days? As far as I, an external, I have seen something or talked to a friend that told me about that. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know anything about it, Glenda. Um, don't know anything about it. Well, I think there is. And so that's something you can investigate on your own. As I said, we've really gone long. So, but Tam and I tend to do that because we want to try and answer every question that you have and every situation. Um, I want to tell you or remind you that on Monday, April the 11th at noon central time, we're going to have a presentation sponsored by the North Central Texas Caregiver Teleconnection with Holly Glover. And it's about ambiguous and anticipatory grief. And so that might be an interesting session um, to hear about that also. Tam, do you have some final words? This has been a great session today. I've really oh. learned a lot and enjoyed it. I have, I have no words, no words. As I no sit words. here and look out at the gray beach and the gray water and gray Galveston. Yeah. I'll it do is. my best. Uh, Y'all have, have a good time till we see you again. Everybody take care of yourself. Please take the time to write yourself a letter today because what you've done is extraordinary and realize what you're doing takes a toll on you and we want to make sure you survive the disease. And then if you there's know, anything Linda and I can do to help, reach out and let us know. We will that's help. Right. Um, do you know what our session is going to be next month, Tam? Are we going to do the ABCs of another? God, I have no idea. I don't no know. Idea. Maybe we might be no doing the ABCs of uh, Alzheimer's. Me. I don't know. It could be that. Watch for uh, the caregiver teleconnection I don't remember. calendar. I don't <laughs> and we'll get Sam help between up. now and then. So <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today. It's been my pleasure to be your hostess for the session today. And I hope you will take care of yourself. And join us again next month for our fun and games and, and good information also. So thank you once again. Bye-bye. Bye, Glenda. Bye, Bye, -bye. everybody. Take care of yourselves.